As we go into our second session on winning Muslims for Christ, let us compare the Quran with the Bible. The Bible is 66 books written by 40 different prophets and apostles in three languages, Old Testament in Hebrew, New Testament in Greek, and some parts in Aramaic. And the Bible is written on three continents, most of it in Asia, some of it in Europe, especially New Testament, some parts even in Africa. Over 1,500 years, at least 1,500 years. Now the Bible says, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, everything shall be established. It's not enough to have one testimony. You've got to have multiple testimonies. The Quran, by way of contrast, is only one book, and it's in fact less text than the New Testament. Some people think the Quran's big because they have very big margins, very big spacing. They put the Arabic on and the English and there's a lot of footnotes. And it makes it look bigger than it is. But if you get, for example, a paperback English-only edition, it's, it's much less than your average novel uh, and it's much thinner than the average New Testament. But the point is the Quran is one book written by one author, Muhammad, in one language, Arabic, in one geographic area, Saudi Arabia, and it was written over just 23 years. Even the Quran acknowledges that Jesus Christ was miraculously born of a virgin, was holy and faultless, performed miracles, healed the sick, and raised the dead. Even the Quran teaches you that. Muhammad, however, by way of contrast, was a trader who transported and sold slaves. He was a slave trader as well. He was a slave owner. We have the names of some of his slaves. This we learn from the Muslims' own holy writings from their hadith, which is the second most holy book in Islam, the Quran, followed by the hadith. Now, we learn also that Muhammad had multiple wives. He started out with just one wife, Khadija, who is much older than him, uh, who is a wealthy widow. But when she died, he accumulated another 14 wives, at least, including Aisha, his third wife, was six years old when he married her, and nine years old when he consummated the marriage according to the hadith. According to the laws of most countries, well, that constitutes child abuse. I mean, that's pedophilia, statutory rape in almost any country in the world. I'm sure in Australia too. Muhammad attacked caravans for loot, like a cash and transit robber. He had over 600 Jewish men, some reports say 900, dig their own graves in Medina and had them slaughtered in front of their wives and children because they refused to accept him as the prophet. He then forced himself upon one of the widows of, this, of one of the men who had been massacred. I was on a radio station in California, and some Muslim phoned in and said, how can you suggest that Islam is anti-Semitic? Why? Muhammad had a Christian wife, and he had a Jewish wife. I said, well... He had a Jewish widow whom he made a concubine. He forced himself on her after she witnessed the massacre of her husband into the grave that he had helped dig earlier. And he had a Christian slave girl, uh, Mary the Copt, as one of his concubines. I don't think this proves your point. Click. Lost the caller. Now, these are not things that some nasty Christian has written. These are facts recorded in the Hadith. Muhammad's not the kind of person you'd want as your neighbor. The authenticity of the Bible as God's revealed word is attested to by many miracles, by many witnesses, such as the opening up of the Red Sea with the entire nation of Israel able to pass through with water on both sides, but walk through on dry land. The fire that came down on Mount Carmel when Elijah was challenging the false prophet of Baal. The feeding of thousands by our Lord Jesus Christ with just a handful of food. Our Lord walking on the water, calming the storm with a single word, raising Lazarus from the grave, and countless other major miracles, many. The Bible contains hundreds of detailed prophecies. Our Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled over 300 Old Testament prophecies just in his life on earth. The Messiah, for example, was to be born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem, a descendant of David descent of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David. He is to be born 483 years after the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. 
He would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. He would be betrayed by a friend. His hands and his feet would be pierced. He would be crucified. Psalm 22 was written a thousand years before Christ was crucified. Hundreds of years before even the concept of crucifixion had been devised. His robe would be gambled for. He would be buried with the rich. Yet he would rise from the dead. He would ascend into heaven. All of these things are prophesied in the Bible and fulfilled in Christ. Notice there's no provision for forgiveness of sins in the Quran, and there's no atonement for sins in the Quran. Jesus Christ, however, is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In the blood of Christ, we have full atonement for sin. Unlike the Quran, the Bible is convincingly attested to by countless miracles and detailed prophecies. If you visit Medina, you'll find the tomb where Muhammad is buried. But if you visit Jerusalem, there is an empty tomb. The Lord Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way because we are lost. He is the way. We are deceived. He is the truth. We are dead in our trespass and sin. He is the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Now, here's a poem I produced some time ago when I started working amongst Muslims. Jesus healed the sick. Muhammad healed no one. Jesus could make the blind man see. Muhammad could only take seeing people and make them blind. Jesus could make the crippled walk. Muhammad could only take the walking and make them crippled. Jesus could take a dead man and make him alive. Muhammad could take a live man and make him dead. Jesus multiplied food to feed thousands. Muhammad could divide his loot amongst his followers. Jesus could walk on the water. Muhammad could ride a camel. Islam is a religion of hatred and slavery based upon a lie. Christianity is a relationship of love with God based upon the truth. You like soccer, rugby, cricket? Here's a scoreboard. Quran versus the Bible. Quran, one book. Bible, 66 books. Quran, one author. Bible, 40 prophets and apostles as authors. Quran revealed in one language. Bible in three languages. Quran written in one country. The Bible written on three continents. Quran written over 23 years. The Bible over 1,500 years. No prophecies in the Quran. Now, I've, I asked Ahmadidat, the founder of the Islamic Propagation Center International, the main debater of Christians, the greatest Muslim evangelist of all time, the one who's written so many books, published in millions of copies, seeking to win Christians to Islam. And I've asked Ahmadidat in the largest mosque in the Southern Hemisphere, in front of the TV cameras, what prophecies are there in the Quran? And the only prophecy he could give me that Muhammad ever made was, well, Muhammad prophesied the fall of the Roman Empire. I said, the Roman Empire fell in the 5th century. Muhammad was born in the 6th century and launched Islam in the 7th century. This is what you call history, not prophecy. I mean, for me to say that the, the Berlin Wall would fall, well, the Berlin Wall did fall. It's, it, it fell 28 years ago. It doesn't require prophetic insight for me to speak about the Berlin Wall falling because it did fall in our lifetime. For Muhammad to speak about an event that took place a century and a half before hardly proves that he had any prophetic insight. There are over 2,000 prophecies in the Bible that have already been fulfilled in detail. Detailed about the fall of Babylon, all the different details about the walls of Babylon being destroyed, the destruction of Tyre, um, all the extraordinary different details that you get in, in the scriptures. The amount of prophecies in the Bible, huge. And our Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled over 300 of them himself. I've asked Ahmadidat, what miracles did Muhammad do? And the only miracle I've ever heard a Muslim come out with that Muhammad did was, and it's based on a Christian legend from the third century, that Muhammad, when he was fleeing from the 
the Meccan uh, soldiers, he hid in the cave and a spider spun a web over the mouth of the cave so that when the Meccan soldiers came past, they saw the spider's web and kept going because they thought, well, nobody could be in there. Now, that's actually a, a legend from Christians that was known from the third century. Anyway, even if it happened, I mean, spider's web's not a particularly strong foundation to build your faith on. Many miracles in the life of Christ and Moses and Elijah. There is a grave in Medina, and there's no question but that Muhammad's body is in it. However, there is an empty tomb in Jerusalem. Jesus is risen. There's no atonement provided in the Quran. There's full atonement provided in Christ and recorded in the Bible. Muhammad taught us to hate his enemies, whereas Jesus taught us to love our enemies. Slavery is not only practiced, supported, endorsed in the Quran, but it's practiced by Muhammad himself. But Jesus came to set the captives free. He proclaimed liberty to the captives, that he had come to set free those in prison, to open the prison doors, to break off the chains of those who are shackled. We regularly hear when we're doing Muslim evangelism that there's only one Quran and it's never been changed. But you Christians, you've got so many Bibles. Well, in my book, Slavery, Terrorism, and Islam, I expose that as a falsehood. Both the time of prayer and the direction of prayer has been changed from the original Quran. Originally, Muhammad declared it was Allah's will that all Muslims pray towards Jerusalem. But after the Jews refused to accept his prophethood, Muhammad changed the direction of prayer from Jerusalem to Mecca. The third caliph, Caliph Uthman, standardized the many versions of the Quran by demanding all versions and copies of the Quran had to be surrendered under pain of death for destruction. At the end, Uthman issued a new revised, standardized, authorized version of the Quran which endures to this day. Now, Christians have never needed to do this, even when the Catholic Church was banning Bible translation and was burning at the stake Bible translators like Tyndale and forcing you to do everything in Latin. Not even the Catholic Church attempted to destroy manuscripts of ancient Bibles. I mean, it's just quite extraordinary. So, as to there being only one version of the Quran, I have on my shelf a number of Qurans, several of which are obtained from Islamic propagation centers, including the translation from Yusuf Ali and the translation by Muhammad Pikthal. There's also translations by Mulana Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali, J.M. Rodwell, A.J. Aubrey, the M.H. Shakir translation, the N.J. Dawood translation of Muhammad Zafullah Khan translations. Now, how can they say there's only one Quran and it's never been changed? Well, they want to tell you, no, well, the only Quran is the one Arabic. Well, that's nonsense. You can translate things from Arabic. And only 16% of all the Muslims in the world are Arabic speaking. 16%. The rest of the Muslim world are not Arabs. And so they do have tr translation of the Quran to different languages, including English. And you go to the Islamic Propagation Center in Sydney, they'll give you it. And they might have a couple of different translations. The differences between the various translations of the Quran are quite interesting. For example, Surah 24, 29, the permitting of plunder. Rodwell translates it, there shall be no harm in entering unoccupied houses for the supply of your needs. So housebreaking is fine. M.Z. Khan's translation adds, wherein are your goods? Dawood inserts to seek shelter. M.H. Shakir and Ali insert them because wherein ye have your necessities. Ahmed Ali writes, wherein is some convenience for you. Whereas Aubrey has a vague, wherein is enjoyment for you. All this to get out of one verse. Surah 434 or 38, because some Qurans vary according to their verse numberings. Dawood, Aubrey, and Rod will translate, as for disobedient wives, beat them. Whereas M.M. Ali and Khan prefer the more obscure translation, chastise them. Some Muslim translators like Ali have tried to soften Muhammad's savagery by retranslating verses like Surah 8.12, strike off their heads, strike off their fingertips, with smite their necks with, and every fingertip. There's a whole lot of things that you get in the Quran. For example, 
it's okay to rape, marry, and divorce prepossessant girls. That's preteens. You can enslave people for sex and for work. You can beat sex slaves, you can work slaves, and you can beat your wives. Uh, you need four, male wit four Muslim male witnesses to prove a rape, and normally in a rape, the woman gets stoned to death because women are 90% to blame for rape because they have the power of enticement, says Sharia law. Um, a woman's testimony is invalid when it comes to any law case. Killing Christians and Jews if they don't convert to pay jaza, I mean, these are all just Sharia law. I mean, really and truly. Dawood translates Surah 868, a prophet may not take captives until he's fought and triumphed in the land. But Rod will use these words in his translation, until he's made a slaughter in the earth. So the assertion is only one Quran and it's never been changed as false. Matthew 9, 39 says, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord the harvest to thrust up workers into his harvest field. Revelation eleven fifteen says, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. All nations will come and worship before you, we read in Revelation fifteen four. We read in Psalm 72, which was read earlier today, the desert tribes will bow before Christ and his enemies will lick the dust. All kings will bow down to him and all nations will serve him. According to some statistics, we have every hour about 667 Muslims converting to Christianity on average. That's like an average from a year. And it's accelerating. May your ways be known on earth. May your salvation be known amongst the nations. May the peoples praise your God. May all the peoples praise you. One of my main mission fields since 1995 has been Sudan. Faith Under Fire in Sudan is a book that has gone through three revisions. It's now three times size the original one. And this is on what I've learned about Islam in Sudan and Muslims coming to Christ. Slavery, Terrorism, Islam is one of our most popular books ever. It's gone through multiple uh, editions. It's now in its uh, fourth edition, three times size the original edition. And this book earned me death threat fatwas. Um, Muslims thought so highly of this book, they actually gave me death threats for writing it. Mind you, the governor of Sudan gave me death threats for writing Faith on the Fine Sudan. And on the official Government of Sudan Ministry of Foreign Affairs website, it states that Peter Hammond should expect to be shot on sight. He should expect to be bombed every time he comes to Sudan because his writings make him an enemy of the state. So, in this book, I say that Islam is an intolerant and violent religion, and to prove me wrong, they gave me death threat fatwas. <laughs> the Muslim Evangelism Workshop, which we're giving today, uh, we've got audios of previous presentations at previous Muslim Evangelism Workshops, uh, available in MP3 audio uh, out at the back too. And I've taken in different film crews who have produced three different films on Sudan, which we've put on one DVD. We got permission from the producers to do so, uh, as one of uh, the uh, rewards for having taken them in to produce these 55 minute, 55 minute, and a 22 minute uh, video. Very interesting. Sudan, the Hidden Holocaust, exposed the war against Christians in Sudan when most people didn't even know it was on the go. Terrorism and persecution, understanding Islamic jihad took it further and has a lot of our most positive testimonies and actually includes footage of um, our churches being bombed. Three Days in Sudan is interesting because it's the odd one out. It's not made by Christians. It's made by a secular humanist war correspondent who came to Sudan with the instruction from the southern government to do a hatchet job on me. In other words, to destroy my reputation. And we didn't know this, of course. We took him in in good, um, good faith. And uh, he ended up doing a very positive documentary for us and, and gave it to us because the government wouldn't broadcast it because he was bombed with us at a church service on day two of his three days in Sudan with us. And it's amazing how bombing can change people's perspective. You can see the big change. In Muslim evangelism, I found More Than Dreams very popular this has got five true life stories of Muslims from different backgrounds converted to Christ. They make it available. Anyone can duplicate, copy them, distribute them widely. I think you can get it off the internet too and share these. Uh, More Than Dreams is a very powerful tool that 
documents how many Muslims have, by dreams, been persuaded to seek out Christians, to seek out Bibles, to uh, search for um, uh, salvation through Christ. And missionaries have had people coming up to them and saying, you know, I had this and that dream and, and how they've been converted. So, uh, ex- extraordinary uh, testimony of Muslims coming to Christ. On our frontline mission essay.org website, you'll get a lot of different resources and contacts and audios and videos and links and our Frontline Fellowship Facebook page, we deal a lot with the Persecuted Church, also IDOP Africa, International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church Africa, is one of our websites and Facebook pages, where we put a lot of focus on the Muslim world and Muslim converts and missions to persecuted churches. Let me give some general guidelines for Muslim evangelism. Firstly, we should avoid offending our Muslim contact by way of inappropriate dress or behavior. What do I mean? Well, they are super, super hyper-legalistic religion, obviously. So, women wearing trousers, men wearing shorts, women wearing sleeveless shirts, a man wearing a vest and not uh, proper sleeves and so on, would all be considered very inappropriate. If we sit and we cross our legs in such a way as to have the sole of our foot facing towards the person. It's a great insult in Arabic culture. Uh, Muslims regard showing the underside of your foot as very, very, very disgraceful. So, for example, you would notice how a Muslim throwing his sandal at President Bush, which was symbolic, or when the statue of Saddam Hussein came down, the people ran up and slapped the, the face of the statue with the sandal, seriously insulting in their culture. So if you sit with your legs cross-legged in such a way that the sole of your foot is faced towards your host, you're insulting them greatly. Um, There's a whole lot of things such as accepting a gift with your left hand or holding the Bible in your left hand. Your left hand's your dirty hand. You must use the right hand for the Word of God, right hand for gifts, the right hand for shaking hands, eating food and so on. Dirty hand, clean hand. So there's, there's a whole range of things, but clothing, the more conservative we dress, the better. I mean, women should be dressed in dresses and very modestly dressed, which Christian witness should be anyway, but even more so if you're dealing with Muslims. Also, bear in mind, a man cannot witness to a Muslim woman. It needs to be Christian woman witnessing to Muslim woman, because to them, contact by any male other than a relative with a woman is disgraceful, criminal, unacceptable. They'd stone you to death or something in uh, Saudi Arabia for that. So there's a whole lot of things that we should understand if we're dealing with their culture. If, if they get offended, let them get offended because of the gospel message. Let them not get offended because I was thoughtless or wasn't dressed wisely or didn't behave in a, in a way that's culturally appropriate. Secondly, we should be humble and prepared to listen and learn. Now, (laughs) this is a picture from Egypt. Uh, Our Coptic friends in Egypt are very, very, very aggressive in standing up for their faith. And when they're dealing with Muslims, they use lots of crosses and they put the Bible in their face. Well, that's probably not the best way for us to go about it. So that when we're witnessing to Muslims, I find it's absolutely vital that we first listen to them. They're not going to listen to us until we've listened to them. So... Let them tell you how they're more Christian than the Christians, more Jewish than the Jews, how clean they are, how much they wash and clean themselves before prayer. Let them tell you about their religious duties first, because only once they've told you that will they actually listen to what you've got to say anyway. And you can learn a lot by asking them questions. Thirdly, be hospitable. Know that Muslims must observe halal law. They are not allowed to eat any kind of food, particularly pork. Inviting around for a pork braai or barbie is not exactly wise. They may be reluctant to eat at your home if you're wanting to invite a Muslim from work or college to your home. They, they're going to be concerned you're going to serve them bacon or you're going to serve them in a way that's not halal. Or, so you've got to uh, discuss the opening. I mean, maybe they can bring the meat dishes and you could bring... You can provide uh, salads or whatever. The main thing is, let's discuss it openly. You know, I, I would like to have you around for a meal. Um, I know you've got to observe halal. How can we resolve this and come up with a solution? Be positive. It's not any good to enter some kind of verbal boxing match determined to fight until one of us is knocked out. I mean, the goal isn't to win the argument. The aim is to win Muslims for Christ. We want to win the person 
we want to see the person converted. It's not just how long can we go in the boxing ring pounding away. You know, he gives his arguments, we give ours. Uh, we want to share the gospel lovingly. So make sure you really understood. Because whatever you say, he's going to misunderstood. You say the son of God. What is he hearing? Are you suggesting that God married Mary? No, of course we're not saying that. Yeah. You're saying the Trinity, are you talking about three gods? No, of course we're not believing in three gods. There's, there's a whole lot of things that, you know, that they will come up with, you know, that uh, Christians are guilty of blasphemy and idolatry and polytheism. And Do you believe that I believe that? And they'll often admit, no, then why are you accusing me of it? I mean, do you really think that we're worshipping three gods? Do you really think we are suggesting blasphemous things about God? And when you start to talk rationally, many of them will back down and admit, no, they, they know that you don't believe that. So, so why are you accusing me of it? But explain your religious concepts and words. Find out whether they've really understood your point. Many Muslims think Christians are immoral. Why do they think that? Because everyone who's not a Muslim in Australia is a Christian, right? So all Australians who are not Muslims are Christians, correct? And so everything that goes on your TV and your streets and your society and your government is Christian. You Christians, and then they'll go on everything from Hollywood, like Hollywood's Christian, and uh, the pornography and the immorality and the drunkenness, and they, remember, they're legalistic, pharisaical, self-righteous type of religion anyway. And so their idea is you Christians, and look at your Christian countries, look at Christian America, look at Christian Britain, look at Christian Australia, and they will damn you to hell along with all the pagans who reject Christians. Because to them, we all one with them. And to get them to understand that, no, we do not support just about anything <laughs> of our secular human society. And so uh, they've obviously, in many cases, misunderstood do not compromise or be over-accommodating. Encourage your Muslim contact to test the truth, to read the Bible for himself, give him the word of God, read in the Injil. Here, here's a copy of, of New Testament Injil, and so on. Trust, uh, and encourage them to read and look for themselves. Offer them a film. Lend them a copy of the Jesus film or the Passion of the Christ to watch. They're interested in those films. But don't be over-accommodating. For example, the amount of Christian Christians I hear speaking about the prophet Muhammad. Now, I don't believe Muhammad's a prophet. He's a false prophet. I don't, but why would I call him the prophet Muhammad? Because they keep calling him the prophet Muhammad. And before you know it, the Christians start using their terminology. And then because they keep referring to Nabi Isa, we start speaking about Nabi Isa. Well, Jesus obviously was a prophet, but he's far more than a prophet. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. So I will consistently try to emphasize in my terminology the Lord Jesus Christ and I'll speak of Muhammad just Muhammad I won't put prophet in front of it and also the amount of Christians that I speak about my brother we do not believe Muslims are brothers they might be our friends they might be our neighbors they might be a co-worker but they're not our brothers unless they've surrendered to Christ and they've been born again then they become your brother in Christ but until they have surrendered to Christ, they are not our brother. And we mustn't cheapen the terms. And so what's also dangerous, and I think is the worst of all, is the amount of Christians who, instead of referring to God or Yahweh or Elohim, are referring to Allah. When we're referring to the Christian God, the God of the Bible, no. We are not wanting to confuse people by over-accommodating. So I would strongly advise, do not attribute prophethood to Muhammad, do not just call Jesus the prophet Jesus. Do not go down the road of uh, calling the God of the Bible Allah. Um, on every point, we need to be careful that we're using our words to reinforce the message and not undermine the message. Compromise really doesn't help. Muslims respect it when we stand. We can be polite, but there's no need for us to, to compromise and dilute the message. And don't just react. Muslims are liable to keep you on defensive. I've spent days and weeks just arguing with Muslims or answering their attacks. And I don't know that we achieved much, except I learned something, I suppose, at the end of it. 
You know, as you start to answer one question, they suddenly, and what about this? And what about that? And he might even have a book in front of him from Amadidat and how to debate with fundamentalist Bible thumpers. And he's just, he's enjoying this. He's not even listening to your response. It's just the moment you start to answer one question, he hits you with another one. You try to answer that and then hits you with another one and ding, 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 backwards and forwards. They'll come up with things like, Jesus goes to this fig tree out of season. He's meant to be a prophet. And yet he doesn't know that the fig tree doesn't bear figs outside of season. And then he curses this fig tree because it doesn't. Now, if he's God, doesn't he know that the fig tree wouldn't give him figs? Doesn't he understand that it's out of season? You know, what's the problem? And, I mean, this is probably one of the lamest attacks you'll ever get. But what the Lord was doing was he's using the fig tree as symbolic of Israel. That Israel, the state of Israel, Judea, um, the, the Jews in his lifetime, uh, they were meant to bear fruit. They'd failed to bear fruit. And he was pronouncing a covenantal curse upon them because they had failed to fulfill their covenant. And he was now coming to remove them and take the message to the Gentiles. So this is part of the gospel message where the Lord used the fig tree as, a, as an analogy, as a prophetic message, pronouncing a judgment upon the people of Judea. And uh, so when you explain to them like that, they'll understand it. But they were trying to misunderstand this fig tree business as though Jesus didn't know and he didn't understand. But he was doing it for the sake of his disciples and for our sake, for it to be recorded. So we should aim to bring the conversation up to something better and guide a conversation. So instead of just arguing, arguing, arguing. And the worst arguments of all, let me warn you, Israel and America. I praise God that when I'm dealing with Muslims, I can say, whoa, I'm not an American. I'm not here representing America. I'm here talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I don't have to defend America's foreign policy. I don't support America bombing everybody in the Middle East. I think they should mind their own business. I think America should take the Swiss model of armed neutrality and stop bombing people. I think they should send Bibles and missionaries instead of sending bombs and marines and everywhere. I don't believe in a support. I, I don't think America's doing the right thing in Syria. I don't think it was right for them to topple Saddam Hussein and invade Iraq. I think they've caused chaos throughout the Middle East. But I'm not here to talk about American foreign policy. And I praise God I can say I'm not a Jew. I haven't even been to Israel. I'm not here to defend Israel's policies on the West Bank or how they're treating the Palestinians. And by the way, even if you are the most 100% pro-Israel, pro-American, even if you were to argue all day and night and week for years, and you were to actually persuade a Muslim that America's foreign policy is good and that Israel's domestic policy in the West Bank was good, you wouldn't get them any closer to the cross of Christ or to salvation. So my advice is don't even go there. We are not doing Muslim evangelism to defend American foreign policy or to defend Jewish West Bank policy. Or We're not there as apologists for the IDF or for the Democratic or Republican Party. I mean, you know, without trying to be nasty, to hell with them all. It doesn't matter. And I'm there trying to speak about the Bible, the gospel, point people to Christ. That who is God? How can he be known? How can we be saved? How can wicked, sinful, depraved people like you and I be accepted by a holy God? And so this is where we're trying to guide the conversation. How can I know that the Bible is the word of God? How do we know the way of salvation? How can we get to heaven? I mean, these are the kind of things we want to discuss. So I would strongly advise, don't even waste a moment on trying to argue politics with them. Because even if we came to political agreement, which personally I think is impossible, it's not going to help bring them to the Lord. So we're not there to win arguments, we're there to win souls for Christ. And let's guide the conversation in a constructive way. So how do we know that the Quran is the word of God? How do we know that the Bible is the word of God? How do we know that Muhammad is a prophet of God? How do we know that Jesus is the only saviour, the way, the truth, and life? These would be constructive discussions. Or, Amadidat and Josh McDowell's debate, was Christ crucified? That's actually a good debate, a good discussion. That's getting somewhere. And uh, that's the sort of thing we want. So if you just go in there and react, it, 
could be like you you betting tennis balls, but there's like 15 people betting tennis balls at you at the same time, and you're just like a fly swatter. And really and truly, it's not very constructive. So as somebody who has seen it, and I must say, the more I deal with Muslims, the more uh, and discuss even what's going on in the Middle East, the more I agree with them that American foreign policy has actually been counterproductive. They have messed up the Middle East, they should stay out of it, and they've just caused nothing but trouble there. But tell the average American that he's got trouble. But if the Americans could just learn to focus on Christ and stop supporting the government's foreign policy, which personally I think is indefensible. Number seven, do not unnecessarily ridicule or debase Islam, Muhammad, the Quran, or even Allah. The door may be closed irrevocably by a hostile attitude. And if you're in a Muslim country, it's a quick way to jail. So, look, bluntly, Muhammad's a false prophet. The Quran's a false book. Islam's a false religion. Allah's a false god. I mean, that's what I believe. But there's no constructive benefit in me saying that up front when I'm in a debate with Muslims and I'm in a Muslim home and I'm doing evangelism. So I'm, when I'm debating with them, my main point is to present the gospel. If in doing so I've got to get them to question some of their faith, fair enough, but I'm not there primarily to attack Islam. I'm there primarily to promote the gospel. And while I'm saying a lot of things very bluntly to you to help you to understand Islam, most of what I've said on Islam is not the sort of thing you want to be saying to Muslims. You don't take the transcripts or the audio of this sort of message to try and win a Muslim to Christ. If you want to win a Muslim to Christ, you want to take them the New Testament. You want to take them the Bible. You want to take them the Jesus form. You want to get them to watch the Passion of the Christ. You want to share your testimony. You want to be involved in explaining important doctrines that help us to understand God, Christ, salvation, heaven, day of judgment. I mean, these are the big things. That's where we're focusing the people. To go in there and to say something that's, you know, I can say some pretty derogatory things about Islam because I've studied it a lot. And I wouldn't say it in an evangelistic context. So, for example, their concept of paradise is awfully sensual and, in fact, worldly. I mean, Muhammad's concept of paradise was of something that, uh, I don't know that you've got the, the concept, we speak about a shabin in South Africa. It's, it's an illicit alcohol uh, place where there's a lot of vice. Because according to Muhammad, paradise is a place where there's rivers of alcohol and there's 70, now, you've heard the word 70 virgins in paradise for every man? That's not the word in the Quran. The word in the Quran in Arabic is Horus. From where we get the word whores from. The Arabic word Horus is the origin of the word whores. It speaks about 70 Horus chained to pillars. This is not 70 virgins. Where they get that translation from, I mean, how you get 70 virgins out of 70 whores, you know, it's, it's like Islam is a peaceful and tolerant religion. Um, it's an abuse of language. It's a very vulgar, coarse sensual vision of paradise. There's paradise where you've got rivers of alcohol. Things that are illegal in a Muslim state is what they're depicting paradise to be. Very bizarre. It's not exactly a spiritual concept. But to go into a Muslim home and say, what's the difference between your Allah and a pimp? is not exactly going to endear yourself to him or help you to bring people to the Lord, even if it's an observation you might make from the way Muhammad describes uh, paradise. Number eight, avoid shortcuts. Do not try to convey the whole content of the gospel in too short a time. Chick publications may look at, make it look like you can just be standing on the street there for a few minutes and share a few things about Allah as the moon god and this Muslim uh, is next thing kneeling down in the street and giving his life to the Lord. That happens in a chick publication tract. It is not real life. It takes a long time. Muslims who've come to Christ normally have months or years of experience before they get to that point. It's a very painful, difficult process. Their entire culture, their entire life uh, is militating against it because he knows if he becomes a Christian, he could lose his family and his life. 
It's a very big step you're asking. And he thinks initially, you are wanting me to commit shirk, idolatry, the unforgivable sin, for which there's no forgiveness in eternity. So you've got a long way to go with a Muslim. Not that we can't reach him, but he needs to be well informed. Words of religious matter need to be defined and discussed. There's no such thing as a short four spiritual laws, uh, seven steps to salvation. This is a massive process. This is like trench warfare in the First World War. You've got a long way to go, and they've got entrenched positions that you've got to overcome. This is spiritual warfare. Ultimately, this is a spiritual battle between life and death, between light and darkness, between God and Satan. We must make prayer a primary weapon. Not our intellect, not our communication skills. Obviously, we must try our best intellectually to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We must be well-trained evangelists. We need good tools, good literature, but primarily, it's a spiritual battle. It is said that we win the people on the streets first on our knees before we go into the streets. But Muslims are coming to Christ. Muslims have come to Christ by the thousands in Indonesia, by the tens of thousands in Sudan, by the hundreds of thousands in northern Nigeria. In fact, that's why a lot of the violence against the church is in those sort of places, because the Muslim militants don't know how to react to this. They're losing ground. They're losing people. Hundreds of thousands, ultimately millions of Muslims have turned to Christ in northern Nigeria and in Sudan, even thousands in Egypt. There are thousands being won to Christ right now in Morocco and Algeria, some very significant movements of the Lord there. I was recently in Belgium, of all places, running Reformation 500 conferences last year in October, and I would have at every major event more Muslim converts, Christians from Muslim background, than Belgians. Reformation conferences. And I'd be having talked, and I found out where they came from. Iran, Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, Morocco, Turkey. And there were more Christians from Muslim background in, in these churches that I was in than Belgians. Now, Belgium is a very hard mission field, but, but right now there's, and these were some of the most dynamic, enthusiastic Christians, but they all came from Muslim background. So there, there is something going on. I, I know in Sudan, entire battalion, 300 men, came across from the north and said, we want to become Christians, we want to fight for the south. I sat down with this commander. I'd heard about this testimony for years. It's, it's in the Faith and the Science and Anvil. And I finally met the commander. And I, said, I sat down with him and I said, how did you persuade the entire battalion of 300 men to all convert and defect? I mean, that's a big step for one person. He said, well, of course, there, there were the radical Muslim fundamentalists. Eight of them, we had to kill them. But everyone else was happy to be converted. Oh, okay, interesting. Uh, but this is the kind of thing going on all over the world. You've got a spiritual battle. And northern Nigeria, it's very, very intense. In fact, I should say about northern Nigeria, you've heard of the terrorist attacks by Boko Haram on the Muslim on the, on the churches in northern Nigeria. Do you know 1,000 churches were attacked in five years? That's between 2010 and 2015. 1,000 churches were attacked. 17,000 Christians killed in five years, just in northern Nigeria, by Boko Haram terrorists alone. But what they don't tell you is that all those churches attacked are churches made up mostly of Christians from a Muslim background. This is a reaction of the Muslims to effective evangelism, and they don't know how to react except violently. This increasing violence of Islam is not a sign of Islam's growing strength. It's actually a sign that then decline and defeat. And the demographers looking at it saying, actually Islam is, is burning itself out, and by the middle of this coming century, uh, it could be imploded and destroyed. Personally, I don't think that's impossible. I'm seeing some of these trends too. They are cracks in the monolithic edifice of Islam. It's not the united edifice it once was. There's a lot of secularism. There are a lot of people turning away from Islam. There's a lot of them turning to Christianity. And the violence is actually desperation and frustration 
of the Muslim fanatics who see they're losing the war. When it comes to Muslim evangelism, I find the gospel and Abraham very, very, very powerful. Now this I get primarily from John Gilchrist, who's written a whole book on this. Do you believe in the God of Abraham? Well, yes, we certainly believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the God of the living, not of the dead. Abraham really matters to Muslims. Why? He's their link to the people of God. Because Abraham had Ishmael through Hagar, and therefore that is a link. They count themselves the children of Ishmael, and therefore uh, Abraham is their father. And so to the Muslims, Abraham is super important. And he's called the friend of God in Arabic. Kalalula, the friend of God. Now we should dwell on this because this is suggesting a relationship that most Muslims don't know about. Why was Abraham called the friend of God? What does this tell us about the relationship between God and Abraham? Actually, it tells us more about Abraham's God than about Abraham. That God wants to have a relationship with his servants. God can be trusted. God keeps his promises. He does not change his mind. He wants to share his plans even with his servants. What an amazing God. Abraham is the father of all true people of God. And the Muslims will be nodding enthusiastically. Because they know Abraham is seen as the father of the Jewish and Hebrew peoples. He is the father of the Christian people. And he's the father of the Muslim people because he's the father of Ishmael. So that they, they see themselves Judaism, Christianity, Islam. They're one of the three monotheistic religions. And so Islam's very proud of being the children of Ishmael and having a link to Abraham. Very important. Now Abraham had a special promise which made him to be a blessing to all the peoples of the earth. Hebrews consider him to be their father. Every true Christian has good reason to see ourselves as descendants of Abraham, Father Abraham. Galatians 3 verse 8 and John 8 56 are remarkable statements. He said that Abraham looked forward and he saw Jesus' day. Abraham looked forward in faith to Christ. Abraham had his faith in the Messiah before the Messiah was born. You see, this tells us about the way of salvation. In all of history, there's only one way of salvation, through the cross of Christ. We look back to the cross for salvation. But people in the days of Abraham and before Jesus looked forward in faith to the coming of the Messiah. There was one way of salvation for people of the Old Covenant and New Covenant. It was all through Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. One event. They looked forward in faith. We look back in faith. Abraham found approval with God through his faith. And Muslims are encouraged in the Quran to follow the faith of Abraham. Okay, so we can have a... I've seen Herod Nielsen, John Gilchrist, really developing the relationship with Abraham in discussions over hours with the, with the Muslims in, in their homes and in their mosques. And so it's a very effective way of evangelism. Really study Abraham, communicate about Abraham, know what the Bible says about Abraham and what the Quran says. Abraham's faith was a reflection of God's faithfulness, and this God reckoned to him as righteousness. Notice the promise of a son to Abraham. This is stated both in the Quran and the Bible. The Quran, Surah 11, 71 says, and we gave her glad tidings of Isaac. Notice Isaac, not Ishmael. Muslims will continue to try and put Ishmael in as the, as the promised son. Obviously, because he's their genetic link, they see, or at least symbolic link. Um, but uh, the Quran does say Isaac, but that doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter which son. The important thing is we're focusing on the faith of Abraham. The command of Abraham to sacrifice his son. Now, the average Muslim believes he sacrificed or attempted to sacrifice Ishmael. It doesn't matter for the illustration of this for evangelistic purposes. We can discuss, so instead of just saying Isaac, just speak about Abraham and his son, so that you're not creating a stumbling block and a sidetrack and an excuse for a bypath meadow uh, going down a rabbit trail. Let's stick to, to Abraham and his son. Can a holy God, can a moral God ask for such a sacrifice, unquestioning obedience to the will of God? Muslims are not yes, because they believe you've just got to obey no matter what, unquestioning. But contrast this with Genesis 22, where God is promising that through his son is going to come Blessings to all the families of the nations of the earth. Abraham must have been shocked. He's been waiting for years for the son to be born in his old age. And now he's asked to kill his son? 
But in faith, he was willing to obey. And he discovered that God intended to reveal to him the glory of salvation. It was a threefold test. First of all, Abraham had to show his love for God, to maintain his trust in God, and to persevere in his faith. And the only solution left for Abraham, God will raise my son from the dead. Hebrews 11 says, Abraham believed that God would raise his son from the dead. This was Abraham's faith. So here we see Abraham was actually foreseeing the whole gospel in a nutshell. That his son, whom he beloved, he dearly loved, his only son, his son of the promise, given through an unusual, miraculous birth when his wife was very old, to be sacrificed as a sin offering. But he'd be raised from the dead and he'd become a blessing to others. Is this not a picture of the gospel? And yet the Muslims believe in us. I mean, they've got, Abraham is about to sacrifice his son. The angel stops him and brings a ram as the place because God himself will provide the lamb. Thus Isaac becomes the object lesson of the atoning work of God's son. And you can ask, what has God done to show his love for you? They'll be stumped. Has God ever done anything for the human race to match Abraham's supreme act of love and self-sacrifice and being willing to offer his own son for God. If the greatest way a man could show his love for God, like Abraham, was to be willing to sacrifice his own son for God, what is the greatest way that God could ever show his love for us? Now once you've presented it, they'll never forget it. They may start objecting, shouting, arguing, but you've got your point over and they'll never forget it because Abraham is so important to them and they know about the sacrifice so much. You present that. They either sit there in shock or they start to argue. But this is all from the true faith of Abraham by John Gilchrist. I've summarized it here very much. Another very powerful, effective tool for evangelism. I've seen Kenneth Niels use many a time and I've used many a time too since um, in dealing with Muslims, they, they love Jesus, they respect Jesus, they revere Jesus. And so to give the teaching of Jesus, they, they like it. In fact, they like religious stories. You can have an evangelistic conversation with Muslims almost any time because most Muslims are happy to discuss religion, argue religion for hours. In their homes, on the streets, in the university, no problem. So Jesus told a parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. The one was a religious leader, and the other was a tax collector, a sinner. The religious leader stood apart by himself and prayed, I thank you, God, I'm not like other men. I fast twice a week. I give one tenth of men to the poor. I'm not like that tax collector over there. The other man stood apart, and he would not even raise his head towards heaven. He just beat his chest, saying, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. Which of the two was right in God's eyes? And I tell you, every single time the Muslims will say, well, obviously the religious leader. I mean, he's like a good Muslim. He's self-righteous, he's religious, he's legalistic. I thank you, God, I'm not like other men. And, and they will immediately, well, of course the religious leader is right in God's eyes. Interesting you say that. Look what the Lord Jesus said. And you get them to read, and the shock. I mean, I don't know how much we appreciate, but all the parables of Jesus were shocking. If you understood the context and you understood who Jesus was speaking to, everything Jesus said was shocking and shook the foundations of the religious worldview of the people he's speaking to. Now, we are so used to the parables of Jesus, they don't seem shocking to us. But they were shocking to the people they're going to. And they are shocking to the Muslims. When the Muslims hear this, I've seen them just look and stare and, and, and they, they um, but why? God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And that message is so hard for the average Muslim to grasp. God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. This gets to the heart of the gospel message. And it's so important. We cannot save ourselves. No religion can save us. None of us are good enough. None of us are righteous. All our righteousness is as filthy rags before our holy God. 
Nothing we do can make us good enough for our creator and eternal God. Nothing we can do can atone for the sins which have stained our life. We have a filthy past. We have a poisonous, rebellious heart. We have problems. Our nature is debased and wicked. Our record is tarnished and shameful. How can a holy God accept wicked, sinful people like you and I into his holy presence? And you present the problem and they are stunned, silenced and shattered. This is a very good beginning to challenge people with. So, you'll get links on our websites, the Muslim Vans and Workshop MP3 out there, recommend the More Than Dreams film. We've got our records of evangelism amongst Muslims available outside. I'm sorry this book is sold out, I did come with some, uh, but one can order them online. The one thing is, um, we do have PDFs of the book in the digital library of the Great Commission course box set, which is mostly audios, but I don't have it here. It is available as an e-book and one can order it online, but the ones I brought across the Atlantic on the plane with me are sold out this time of those. But we need to be praying for the Muslim world and we've got a lot more to tackle in this afternoon session. We've come to the lunchtime uh, opportunities. I'll be very glad to be answering people's questions during lunchtime, during tea time, and of course we've got a Q&A in the last session as well. Uh, but let us close in prayer at this point. Lord God, we want to thank and praise you for your love, for your mercy, for your grace that you have rescued us of the kingdom of Satan and brought us into the kingdom of your own dear son. Help us, Lord God, to better understand our Muslim neighbors, whether they're friends or strangers, that we may be able to share the gospel with them in a way that is meaningful and effective and reach out to them and communicate something of the wonder and the amazement of the gospel that we would get people who are trusting in their own works righteousness for salvation to realize that that will never bring anyone into your presence as anything but a condemned guilty sinner who is hell deserving for eternity. Help us, Lord God, to point people to Christ, the way, the truth, and life. Help us, Lord God, to be faithful to your word to be effective in your service. We pray to all in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.